uh, Dr. Erica Brown uh, is well known to all of us as one of the uh, uh, premier Jewish educators of our time. She's the director of the Mayberg Center for Jewish Education and Leadership at the George Washington University. As Mark Wilf mentioned, just published a new book uh, on Esther uh, uh, called Esther, Power, Fate, and Fragility in Exile. Erica Brown, thanks as always for being with us and on short notice making time for the Federation uh, world uh, and we welcome you. Thank you very much. Um, it says in the book of Esther in a critical moment when Esther moves from object to subject, lech knos et kol hayudim, gather all the Jews together. And so I wanna thank all those who organized this call because I think it's a beautiful expression on Purim of bringing Jews together to talk about some of the critical uh, issues of the day and to look at it with a, a genuine Jewish lens, an ancient Jewish lens on what perhaps we can learn from the book of Esther about our own leadership and about how we manage in a time of uncertainty. Um, only yesterday did it start to, the, the, the responses, the anxiety start to really uh, get under my skin and internalize it. And, um, and you know, the anxiety of being hyper-conscious of everything, um, of, of everything we touch, of, of, of the presence of other human beings. And I think as a Jewish community, we feel that a little bit more because we function so much as a community. We're in the presence of people all the time. Our attitude in the nonprofit world is to really bring people together. So the idea of social distancing is particularly hard. So what I wanna do is look at, um, look at this issue of leadership in a time of uncertainty, which is certainly a subject of a lot of leadership literature and connect it to our Megillah and um, perhaps look at some insight from this ancient wisdom that we can take into today and to every day. So I'm going going to ask uh, Jennifer if you can please uh, change the screen and put up our handout for today. Thank you. So uh, thanks very much. This is an illustration from a 400 year old uh, Megillah from Ferrara, Italy. Um, I actually thought that it was, it, it kind of, to me, it, it was the, I looked for an illustration that most captured the sense of what this virus feels like for many of us. And you can see the anxiety on the faces of each of these uh, characters painted into, painted on parchment, this sense of, um, you know, Esther here in the center at a feast, and yet there's no, there's no sense of happiness. And I think that's, uh, that's been the, the sense for many of us as conferences that we were attending or maybe even hosting or getting canceled, as, uh, as, as things that we care uh, pr profoundly about are now covered in a layer of conversation. It's kind of hard to escape the conversation around this. So what I wanted to do is to, to direct you to uh, uh, two things that have been helpful for me. One is um, an article put out by the Russell, Russell Reynolds Associates called Leadership Through Uncertainty. And I just wanna read that with you. Great leaders have the ability to devote the appropriate resources to the immediate needs of the organization while maintaining a focus on long-term strategic goals. These leaders don't hesitate to make the hard choices to address short-term priorities. They also demonstrate the courage to preserve the investments that are essential to the long-term health of the organization. In the face of uncertainty, weak leaders are guided primarily by concerns over the optics of their decisions. Strong leaders are guided by a clear view of the sacrifices required to preserve strategic direction. And I think um, because we're gonna have this conversation from a leadership standpoint, it's very difficult to know how to balance the short-term needs of a community that is saying, we're afraid, we're in this time of ambiguity. This is unprecedented. And a lot of us are dealing with the unprecedented nature of this. And yet we can cancel things, postpone things uh, in, in, indefinitely, and then feel that somehow our short-term outcomes have not been balanced by our strategic long-term vision. So this, this notion of how do we maintain our core values, even if we have to make some short-term decisions that may not uh, allow us to live up to our missions. And then I wanna uh, turn our attention to Primal Leadership, which is co-authored by Daniel Goleman, who is the pioneer of emotional intelligence and has applied a lot of his thinking to, to, to uh, leadership and particularly leadership in ambiguity. He opens the book this way and, I, I, and he discusses the response that leaders had to September 11th, another 
unprecedented event in American history. So he says, because the leader's way of seeing things has special weight, leaders manage meaning for a group, offering a way to interpret and so react emotionally to a given situation. Group members generally see the leader's emotional reaction as the most valid response and model their own on it, particularly in an ambiguous situation where various members react differently. In a sense, the leader sets the emotional standard. And I, I wanna just focus on what he's saying because I think it's so important. Many of us don't, we view ourselves as managing organizations and not necessarily as managing meaning. When people get to an unprecedented situation, a situation of uncertainty, one they haven't been in before, they're looking to us and they're gauging their own response in relation to ours. If we overreact or underreact, that's what they're going to do. And so it, it's hard because there's no sweet spot. There's, there's no right and wrong in this. Um, there's getting the, the, the temperature and the weather, but also trying to shape it in some way, trying to help people by creating solutions without creating or generating additional panic. So I'd like to turn to a, a, a moment in the text, and I'll ask Jennifer if you can turn to page two. Or scroll us down. Um, thank you. So this is from uh, from chapter three in Esther. Esther's already been uh, designated this beauty queen. Um, she has uh, she has not yet had her moment of, of uh, to shine. She's simply a contestant winner who has gotten the king's favor and the king's adoration. And so the text says. Um, this is the text of Esther 3, 14 and 15. The text of the document uh, was to the effect that a law should be proclaimed in every single province. It was publicly displayed to all the people so they might be ready for that day. The text in effect was Haman's decree that the Jews should be destroyed, that he would put in money in the, the royal coffers because Jews had paid taxes, special taxes to the king, which he had to supplement and replace if he wanted to destroy them. And suddenly, without the king actually knowing, King Ahasuerus knowing that the Jews were the, the population at risk, he simply handed over his signet ring. He was an uninformed monarch who was willing to be manipulated by an evil and conniving minister. And so Ahasuerus grants Haman's permission, Haman permission, and the postal service sets out to do its duty. Now, of course, one of the characters, the unnamed characters in the book of Esther is the bureaucracy of government. And we're meant to see this heavy and rigid ineffectual system as, and, and this book as a referendum on these kind of foreign potentates who, who are tyrannical, who make random and impulsive decisions that affect the population at large. And certainly when it goes out to everyone, the notice goes out to everyone, then, uh, then it makes the, 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 the decree official. The courtiers went out post haste on the royal mission and the decree was proclaimed in the fortress Shushan. The king and Haman sat down to feast, but the city of Shushan was dumbfounded. Va'ir Shushan Nevocha, it says in Hebrew. Some of us recognize that term, Nebuchim, from the Mor Nebuchim, Maimonides' famous book uh, called The Guide to the Perplexed, which is a great name uh, for any book. Uh, but this, the idea that the city of Shushan, the capital city, was confused or dumbfounded, I think is the way that many of us are reacting to all these proclamations, to the constant news cycle where things change. Should we, should we quarantine? Should we not quarantine? Should we go to Israel for Passover? Should we not? Should we hold this conference or not? And I think the dominant feeling is confusion. And so in that state of confusion, the next verse is particularly important. And that next verse is Esther 4, 1. And I'll just read one through three. When Mordechai learned that all that had happened, Mordechai tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes. He went through the city crying out loudly and bitterly until he came to the front of the palace gate because one could not enter the palace gate wearing sackcloth. In every province that the king's command and decree reached, there was mourning among the Jews, fasting, weeping and wailing, and everybody lay in sackcloth and ashes. Mordechai basically understood that everyone was confused. And in a time of confusion, in a place where no one is a leader, in a place where there is no one who is standing up from a point of conviction, Mordechai acted. He not only followed the rules, he somehow broke them when he needed to. In this instance, he needed to alert people to the danger. 
He put on sackcloth and ashes, a very public demonstration, came out into the middle of the city, although usually it was at the King's Gate, and he let everyone know. And in response, just as uh, Goldman says, the leader manages meaning, when Mordechai dressed this way, he helped others understand how serious this was. So on the one hand, as we're thinking about leadership in the moment, I know people who have minimized the significance, who have not been sufficiently sensitive to the anxiety. And it's really important for us, I think, to acknowledge the anxiety that people are feeling, the confusion, and the fact that this is, has mentally preoccupied us. It's virtually everything that everyone is, it's virtually dominates all conversations, everything that people are talking about. And so I think on one hand, it's important for us as leaders, number one, to acknowledge anxiety from a, Jew, from a Jewish perspective as we see in the Purim text, number two, to direct and model the behavior that we expect of others, which means that we put up notification about proper hygiene, that we give people, um, as we're doing in the university, an excused absence if they need to work from home, but at the same time, helping people maintain their grip on the work that needs to be done. And that's important because there are children who are not in schools, there are people who are not at work, and so what they're losing is a sense of routine. How can we be sufficiently flexible, put all the mechanisms in place that allow people to learn, to work, to volunteer, to continue in some level online because thank goodness we have the technology that enables to do this. And so that, that requires a degree of, of shifting gears. We as Jews, we're survivors. We've kind of figured out what to do when times are difficult. And Mordechai stepping in right away in the state of confusion and taking a role of conviction signaled to everyone else that it was important that they do the same. But the other thing, and I, I think Eric and, and Mark pointed to this as, as really critically important, is that this is a month of our happiness, and it's important to help people hold on to happiness without being frivolous and dismissive. We have a statement in the tractate Tanit, in our um, Talmudic tractate about fasting, when the month of Adar begins, one increases rejoicing. Well, unfortunately for us, when the month of Adar, the Hebrew month of Purim began, our anxiety kept increasing. And I, I just wanted to expose uh, two sources um, that have been uh, special for me in thinking about what it means to hold on to happiness, particularly, and, and as a leader to model happiness, particularly at a time when, it's, uh, when, when, we're, when we're in a state of confusion. So Rabbi Nachman Mibretzlav, who, uh, as Arthur Green called, the tormented master, um, was someone who struggled with his own personal unhappiness, but also really thought a lot about how we promulgate happiness. And he says, you must be very, very careful to always be happy. With happiness, you can give another person life. There are people who suffer terrible pain, but cannot express what is in their heart. When you come to such a person with a smiling face, you can li literally give that person life. To give a person life is not an empty gesture. It's something very great indeed. So this idea of all the small gestures that we can communicate that give people a sense of life. And whether that means today on Purim to give extra people charity, to, uh, to smile more, to, um, to be more assuring, to be comforting in ways that people uh, find hope and, and optimism. I think that, uh, that for us as leaders, that is particularly crucial at this time. And the last is, um, it's a very, very beautiful piece of Talmud. And I must uh, share with you that I learned of this piece of Talmud actually at a funeral. Not only a funeral, but it was a funeral for a child, a child of four who brought a lot of happiness into his parents' life. His father stood up and he said this at the funeral. And so I wanted to give you both the text and the context in which I learned it, because I, I assume that if someone can say this text at this very vulnerable moment of suffering in his personal life, that it's something that we should all take to heart. Rav Barucha Chosa used to frequent the market at Bela Prat, where Eliyahu, or Elijah the prophet, often appeared to him. Once again, so imagine this kind of fictitious setting in a market. Once this rabbi asked the prophet Elijah, is there anyone in this market who has a share in the world to come? And he replied, no. While they were conversing, Two men passed by and Elijah remarked, wait, these two have a share in the world to come. Rabbi Barocha then approached and asked them, 
what is your occupation? He, of course, wanted to know if you have some kind of share in the world to come, what is it that you have contributed in life to merit this? And they replied, we are jester, jesters. When we see men depressed, we cheer them up. And of course, we're not asking any of our leaders to be jesters, but we are, uh, I think that this uh, piece of Talmud is, is, is asking us to think and to consider what our own response is when people come to us and say, we're not sure what to do, we feel so anxious, we feel so confused. And in some way, although we need to give practical direction, we also need to play the role of cheering them up. So that is, um, that is a, a bracha, a blessing, uh, to be in a capacity where we have influence, but to use our influence wisely to address people, to make sure that they consider the situation with the seriousness in which it deserves, but also to make sure that we can keep people, people's levels of happiness up, that we can keep them optimistic in a situation where they may feel hopeless and confused. And with that, I wanna wish all of you a Purim Sameach, a happy Purim, a blessed Purim, and a healthy Purim. Thank you.